Uh, it's wonderful to welcome you here for the first ever State of Our School, a report on the University of Texas Dell Medical School. Exactly one year from today, the first class of Dell Med students will be graduating. Yeah. And we are so proud of what this first class has accomplished in laying the groundwork for future classes uh, for Dell Medical School. But this is also a time to reflect on a five-year anniversary. And it's the five-year five anniversary of our dean, Clay Johnson, who I'll introduce in a, min in a minute. But none of us would be here today without the visionary leadership of so many people and so many leaders from our community, starting with Senator Kirk Watson, who I know would like to have been here today, uh, but the legislature's got one week left, which I'm glad for, and I know he is. Uh, but he, uh, he was so critical in building the support of this incredible community in Austin and Travis County. The voters of Travis County, who did something unprecedented and unexpected by many people outside our community, uh, to support a medical school to bring high quality health care to all people in Travis County. Uh, generous donors, uh, Michael and Susan Dell, and we're so glad to have Janet Mountain, the head of the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation with us today, truly a founding investor in this medical school. Jim and Miriam Mulva, and so many other donors who have helped make this possible. And then my predecessor, Bill Powers, who really led uh, the whole plan, working with our Board of Regents uh, to put this all together, and this is where we are today. And I remember in 2013, we had a small uh, steering committee to plan for what became Dell Medical School. At that time, it was just the medical school. And I remember as we were, one of our initial meetings, we were talking about how are we gonna get students to come to a brand new medical school. Why would a good student want to come to a startup? How are we going to recruit faculty? We have no academic medical center here. How are we going to get the best faculty to lead a top academic medical leave a top academic medical center for maybe a fly-by-night operation? But I was most, most worried about how are we going to get the right dean? to lead Dell Medical School in its formative stages, its growth period, its startup, its growth period. And uh, I remember when we first met Clay Johnson at the uh, first meeting in our search committee, and uh, uh, everybody knew he was, the, he was the person to lead Dell, Dell Medical School to get it started. And shortly after that, uh, during uh, one of the several interviews it took to convince him and Clarissa to come to, uh, come to Austin, especially Cl Clarissa. Uh, it, I remember walking in the parking lot, right where we're standing now, right where you're seated, seated now, the parking lot, and laying out what our master plan was for the facilities for Dell Medical School. Dell Seton Hospital is on the tennis courts, and boy, that's a whole nother story about tennis courts, but I, it's not for today. But it was more than just the buildings. It was the vision for how to address the tremendous problems this country has in healthcare, and what we can do at a great research university, and what we can do in this community to change healthcare, to make people healthy, to keep them healthy, and to do it with a better value and lower cost and better outcomes. And he was the person who had that vision. So it gives me great pleasure this morning in the first inaugural, the inaugural State of Our School address to introduce the founding dean of the University of Texas Dell Medical School, Dr. Clay Johnston. Thank you, Greg. Thanks so much. That was great. So thank, thank you, Greg. Um, it's been wonderful working under your leadership and also of, of yours, uh, Maury. It's uh, been fabulous having you uh, more recently as provost and, and uh, being on this adventure with you all. It's also great to see uh, so many of our own people from Del Med, but so many others who are part of our larger family and including our uh, partnering organizations, which I'll, I'll get to, but we've got uh, you know, lots of, of important people here, not just in the first row, but throughout. Um, and I will 
um, thank you all as, I, as, I, uh, um, as we get to those specific sections um, where, uh, where I get to mention you. Um, it's so funny, you know, normally I don't have notes. When, they, when, we, when we first planned this, they said, well, we're gonna put this teleprompter up in front of you and you're gonna read off this, this uh, formal address. And, and I, I was like, I just can't do that. <laughs> so we compromised. So I do have some notes, but it, I'm not gonna read them. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I'm going to be mostly behind this podium, but I'm also not going to respect that um, completely <laughs> either. So they better be moving cameras and stuff and be ready for that in the back. So um, first, let me uh, eliminate um, any suspense uh, to, uh, to say that the, the state of the school is strong. <laughs> so we're done. And then, you know, one of the things that I've, I've learned in, in, this, in this role over the last few years is the power of a story. So, you know, I'm a data guy. I like to focus on data. And we're going to show you some data and probably, I don't think it'll be more than you, than you want to see. But the stories really are much more powerful. So I'm going to start today with my, a bit about my own story. And some of you know pieces of this and, and, and some of you don't. It, it's, it, as Greg mentioned, this marks five years of being here, which is hard to imagine, but yes, I have been here five years, um, and uh, um, it, it, you know, why? You know, why did I make this change? So for, for me, it goes back to uh, what it meant to be a doctor. So, um, you know, I graduated medical school 27 years ago. Uh, man, am I old. <laughs> Actually, that's, that's half my lifetime ago, just to put that in perspective. So half my lifetime ago, I graduated from medical school, um, and I wanted to make people better. And I came to the realization pretty early on that a lot of the stuff that we did in clinical care, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. We, we had stories about why it made sense. We relied on our understanding of the science behind it or follow, followed on the, the opinions and, and observations of the people who came before us. But it was pretty clear a lot of that was wrong. Um, and a lot of that was really more uncertain than anyone acknowledged. And so that pushed me to, towards research to say, okay, well, we've got to then come up with these answers. We, it's not just about treating that person in front of us because we don't know optimally how to treat that person. We need to be thinking about how we learn, not just from that person, but from many people to advance the whole science of how we treat people. And so that kind of changed direction for me to say, okay, well, I'm going to make research a big part of my career. And so I started on a little question. So by now, I had finished my neurology training, and I was really focused on stroke um, as my primary interest. And there were these weird, these things, that were, they were like strokes, but the symptoms went away. People were normal again. They're called TIAs, or transient ischemic attacks. And you may have heard of them. They're fairly frequent. They're about 300,000 that occur every year. So these are happening all the time. And we didn't really know what to do with these people. Um, we were admitting all of them, and we were doing all these, putting them on blood thinners and all this stuff. Some of them were getting um, hemorrhages from that, and, and um, we didn't really know what we were doing. Across town, they were just saying, oh, you're fine. You look normal. We'll see you in clinic in a couple weeks. Huge differences in the way they were being treated, just in one city. Both reasonable approaches to these patients. So, so my first major study was um, to, and this is now 20 years ago, was to ask the question, what happens to these people? Are, you know, if, they're, if it's dangerous to have one of these spells, it's probably because they're gonna go on and have another stroke or something bad. If it's not dangerous, and then they should be admitted and we should try to treat them seriously. If it's not dangerous, we should, we should let them go back to clinic and leave them alone with all the blood thinners and stuff. And so we did a study. We tracked a year's worth of TIAs in a fixed system, the Kaiser system in Northern California. And if, if they did well, no events would happen. It'd be a straight line across the top. But in fact, that wasn't the case. Bad things happened to these people, lots of strokes. One in nine had a stroke. Um, most of those strokes were just within the first couple days. So lots of bad things happening, and it wasn't really understood at that time that that was the case. Not just strokes, heart attacks, deaths, and um, other events that led them into the hospital. So really bad things. So at that time, we said, gosh, you know, this is a, these are horrible outcomes. We need to try to prevent them. And so it made sense to treat with a 
things that block uh, uh, clotting, because clotting is really what's causing this stuff. And so we proposed a really simple idea. You remember Plavix, all those annoying ads that you'd see on TV? So um, it's, a, it's a great drug, it really works. And so we were gonna test it in combination with aspirin to try to block these events from happening. So we proposed that, this was now 20 years ago, and last year, so 19 years later, we got an answer to that simple question. That took 19 years, and it was a wonderful, you know, it did a big trial and all that stuff, but 19 years to ask one little question? So that suggested to me that maybe it wasn't just more research, but a difference in our thinking about how we do research, that that wasn't an acceptable, an acceptable timeline to get an answer to a simple question. And then the other thing that I was doing 20 years ago was studying these things called aneurysms. So these are just weaknesses in blood vessels. They can be in different parts of your body, but they're particularly dangerous when they're in, inside your skull. Um, because if they bleed, the chance of you dying is actually pretty high. So, and they're fairly common. Again, these are like, you know, half a percent will have one of these. Um, not that ruptures, but that's there. And so there are two techniques for treating them. You open up the skull, you lift the brain up, you put a little roach clip on the thing, or you fill, <laughs> the th you fill it from inside with coils. And you can do that from a little catheter that goes up through the groin and you fill it up. And um, it ends up, in our early studies, it was pretty clear that coiling, and you might, I mean, you might just guess that, right? You don't have to manipulate brain and stuff. The coiling worked better. Um, that it, the outcomes were substantially better for coiling. Like, you know, almost a magnitude of difference in terms of both mortality and morbidity from the procedure. So that, again, was 20 years ago. And then after that, a whole bunch of other studies showed basically the same thing. Still. The, your, whether you get one of these or, or another is more dependent on the hospital that you go to than it is on what is the right technique for you. 20 years ago, we knew the answer, and our health system wouldn't deliver the right answer. It wasn't optimized to produce the right answer for patients. So those sorts of observations led me to realize it was really not on the research side at all. It's really on the health side on how, we do, how our health system is oriented and how it needs to be reoriented. If we really want to accelerate innovations and improve outcomes for patients, we actually need to redesign the system. We need to be thinking completely differently about it, not taking for granted that the way we've always done things makes sense. And so this is just an example to me about how easy it is just to do it the way we've always done it. So, you know, most of us in this room are accustomed to carrying our bags, right? Do you remember this? I mean, it's, uh, um, it, we had these big bags, and remember the old Samsonite bags? And, the, um, and it, was a, it was a hassle, and if you, if you had money, you'd, you know, the, uh, the bellhop guys would pick them up for you and take them to the, to the gate, and, and you definitely wouldn't carry, do a carry-on bag on an airplane. You would check that thing and, and be rid of it. Well, it's kind of bizarre that, that that's a, you know, that. We had this suitcase, this notion for a bag for hundreds and hundreds of years, probably thousands, you know, if you go back far enough. But, you know, we also had this thing called the wheel. <laughs> and the wheel is an ancient discovery. So, you know, what the heck took us so long to say that these two could come together <laughs> and create a solution to this problem of carrying these giant bags, right? I mean, just, I mean, I, I, it's, it's kind of, it is funny, but it's, it's also so sad. What does this really say about us? You know, that, that we get so set in our patterns of doing things that obvious, obvious innovations are unapparent to us, right? So this notion, too, that, um, that one needs permission, one needs a setting, one needs people to open your eyes up to the possibilities, and that these things don't necessarily require new technologies and artificial intelligence and all this stuff. It just requires a rethinking, a reorientation, and opening your mind. And that's one of the, the big advantages 
of uh, uh, starting from scratch. When you start from scratch, you give yourself permission. You can, if you don't have to, you can give yourself permission to, to truly deeply think about the conventions and how they're set up and, and whether they make sense or whether it could be done a better way. In addition, we had some amazing opportunities here in Austin, right? So to, to come to a university like UT and be able to tap into the multidisciplinarity that exists here, you know, which is so rich in so many ways, to come to a progressive city like Austin, tech forward, but also socially minded in ways that very, very few other cities are. San Francisco thinks it is, but it is not uh, <laughs> compared, to, compared to Austin. To come with a, a, the a safety net system um, the, uh, through um, central health that's really trying to move the bar and think differently about how to care for the most vulnerable in our population and to have a city that's invested in that. And a city also invested in its med school, which again, never, we've, we've been looking and we can't find another example of where you know, a, a community raised their own property tax to, to start a med school. Um, and we're commemorating that, by the way, there's a plaque that we've just placed out there to acknowledge how important the community has been and how important it is now that we're linked back to that. And I, I just want to acknowledge our partners. Uh, um, so I, I, I'm not going to do specific names because I'll get in trouble. But we have a number from uh, uh, you know, Mike Gieselin, I'll, I'll mention from uh, uh, Central Health, but also uh, two of the Central Health board members are here. Maybe others are as well. Um, and uh, um, and uh, they've been absolutely uh, a great um, uh, work to work with. Um, we also had a, a, a wonderful um, uh, uh, safety net uh, nonprofit healthcare system through Seton that was already providing a lot of um, uh, indigent care through the hospital system. We have a number of their representatives here kind of strewn throughout. Um, but uh, um, I, I, again, I, if I get into names, then I'll, I'll get in myself in trouble. Um, uh, and so that was the, the basis of the opportunity here. So it took me, who, you know, and, and many others, right? These are my observations, but they're not alone for me. They're, there's so many others that have had very similar observations. This ability to come in in a perfect environment to, to think about how things could be uh, different. In order to do that, it, it really is important to, to get the right people. Um, and the key there is, are these people who can do something uniquely here that they're particularly passionate about that wouldn't be possible pretty much anywhere else? And so that became the target for our leaders. And we've had a whole bunch of them now, uh, and we continue to, to grow that group. Um, and um, one of the things I wanted to do today is to not have you only have to hear from me. So we're, we've integrated some videos. So now uh, some of, of the others in Dell Med can tell you about um, why they came here. Oh, I forgot about this slide. This is just to say place is so important. Um, that the, um, you know, we're just like, you know, Florence in the 15th century where you had people questioning all these, uh, you know, beliefs, whether they're in science or in art or architecture, you know, that that, that ability to coalesce the right people and to make a, a place special um, to move those ideas forward, it can be transformative for human culture, right? That has happened before. All right, so... I was attracted to Delmed because of its unique vision. They're taking a different approach, looking at how healthcare is delivered, not just the most efficient way, but the way that benefits patients the most. There's decades of evidence of what actually helps people, but it's been hard to translate that into day-to-day -day medicine. I came to Dell Medical School to partner with my patients in new and more meaningful ways. The role of design in health and healthcare is to question some of the fundamental assumptions that have been the foundation of our healthcare system for generations. The circumstances that surround the creation of the medical school and the permission and authority we have to make real change in ways that are very meaningful are what drew me here. I was attracted to coming to Dell Med because I usually approach the jobs that I'm most interested in by thinking about the communities I'm going to work within. And in this case, I was joining two communities. One of those communities is the medical school. The other is Austin. It's not just that I work here, I live here too. They, uh, 
they, they did a great job with these videos. I, our communication team is amazing. Um, so we started with this notion, okay, we've got all these, we have this huge opportunity, right? So we could do it the old way or we could really try to think about how we could do better. We could be better aligned with society's interests. We could create a curriculum that was more around filling the gaps in the health system that, that my generation helped to produce and, and propagate, that, that we could think about the research system in a different way to accelerate innovations, think about the way we interact with the community, the way we deliver on that community promise differently. So we, we started out with this notion that we're gonna rethink everything, and that was a great, great starting point. Um, but rethink only goes so far, right? You can do so much thinking, and this is what happens in an ivory tower, right? Which is not exactly what we don't wanna be. Um, it's really about moving from rethink to remake, proving that those ideas aren't just ideas, but that they have teeth, that they can, they can move the system forward. So we're moving on to this notion of health is happening here. And it's not meant to be exclusive. It's not to be saying, oh, it's happening here, but it's not happening over there. It's happening here together. It's something that we want to, to bring others to, uh, to the table in, in understanding. And this is, um, the, the, then the, again, the issue is prove it. Right, so prove it. What is it that you're doing? So, so here's some examples of, of uh, how, um, how we're already. Uh... The most important thing that I'm learning here is how to connect with people. Here at Del Med, the residents are forging deep personal bonds with our patients and the community at large. That translates to hundreds of residents working thousands of hours, and that ends up helping tens of thousands of people. Back in 2012, I was dealing with a bad knee, so painful, and I couldn't even move. I went to UT Health Austin. I'm feeling really good since I can do all my routines. I can play basketball, racquetball, I can climb the stairways, I can walk uh, four to five, six miles a day, and I've been doing okay. No problems whatsoever. So this partnership with Dell Medical School has not only become close, but extremely meaningful uh, with integral care. One in five have a major mental illness at some point in their life. And so when we're working with the Dell Medical School on treatment outcomes, it isn't just the individual, but it has to do with the wellness of our community. My mother had severe arthritis of her hip. She was no longer able to walk up the steps. We wound up seeing Dr. Bozik and his team at UT Health Austin. She had a team of folks all helping her not just with the problem of her hip, but with everything else that's impacted by having severe arthritis. If it weren't for Dr. Bozik and his team at the medical school here, I don't know where she would be, and I am eternally grateful. So now some sp uh, specifics about, you know, we think about sort of the pillars of, of uh, Dell Med School. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through some of the, some of the data, because I'm, I'm a data guy, um, but we've, we've condensed it down so it won't be, for those less numbers oriented, um, it won't be overwhelming. But on the student side, um, you know, we didn't know, just as, as, as Greg mentioned, we had no idea whether students would be interested in what we were doing or not. But that, we know they are. Um, so we now had, we had 5,200 applicants for our class of 50 this last year. And, and um, our, once we offer a spot, our rate of acceptance of those spots is extremely high, which makes us one of the most selective schools in the country. That's been true from year one, and it was true again this year, so really remarkable. We have a diverse class, so the, the U.S. averages for underrepresented minorities is it's about nine percent of a class, which is horrible, right? So you know that it's easy to it should be easy to beat that standard, but it is really hard because all the schools are competing for the same candidates. Our numbers are at least twice that, um, and um, we're uh, we're showing what an education new education system could look like with lots of international visitors trying to learn from our curriculum. The, last, the fourth class is starting uh, just about a month from now, um, and uh, this class has 
as uh, Greg mentioned, is graduating exactly a year from today, not just a year, at exactly a year from uh, uh, today, which is, which is really remarkable. Um, all our third year students, our third year is particularly unusual and wonderful, um, and, um, and all of them are uh, uh, working um, on some project that addresses a, a health need um, in the community and doing that often across multiple disciplines. So the, our education team is superb. Again, I won't, uh, some of them are right here. I don't know where Sue Cox is. She's been there from the very beginning, but um, and again, a, a fabulous uh, uh, system and wonderful progress. Oh, I should say, the residencies too are growing. Residents are really important after med school. We've grown our residency programs. They're improving. They were already good. They're even better. Um, and we'll continue to, uh, to grow them. They are a really important part of, the, of, uh, of the, the workforce that provides care across the community, including uh, um, to, uh, in the settings uh, in, across Austin, including East Austin. On the clinical side, so our clinics have only been opened uh, for a year and a half, um, but we've already seen, uh, we've had uh, almost 34,000 appointments and seen 11,000 patients. Um, about half of those are, um, a little over half, are uh, Medicaid or MAP or uninsured patients. So, uh, you know, meeting that part of our mission is really important. But underneath that is really beautifully designed care, right? Perfectly designed care from the start, from the ground up. And the outcomes are better and the costs are lower. And that's really what we're trying to prove now converting that business model over so that we actually get paid for value, which is gonna be critical to growing this out and this part of, uh, of what we need to do in the future. Pediatrics has moved forward dramatically, quickly. I'm looking at Chris Bourne right now, um, who was um, president at um, Dell Children's. Um, but both in cardiovascular disease, also in neuro, and in many other areas that we'll be adding um, is a you know, remarkable uh, transition. And again, wonderful to have. Uh, Seton as a partner, um, and then our uh, programs in the neuroscience too are another area where we've gone deep. Cancer's coming and will um, will grow quickly over the next few years. On the research side, um, we have we've gotten a large number of grants that are really meaningful grants, and we've got the investigators here who are um, doing really remarkable work um, in whether that's cancer work and funded by CPRIT, which thankfully will maybe continue, we'll see, um, uh, depending on the last few days of legislature and what happens in the fall. Um, and then um, also um, uh, working on how we get funding for new models of care. We've built on campus collaborations that are really rich, and we have collaborations across every single school at UT, which is really remarkable. At first, we couldn't figure out uh, the geosciences. You know, how do you, how do you, <laughs> geology and rocks moving and all that stuff. And then we, then we realized, oh, well, global warming is actually, you know, and all the things that are happening with climate change, that's, that's there, and it's here. And so we even, we even got that one checked off this year. So now we're done. <laughs> We've got it across the, across the board in terms of these collaborations. And those are really rich and are bringing, you know, new programs to not just us, but to, to others as well. And then I have two slides on community impact um, because uh, you know, we've made such progress in this area. So one is we now have a partnership with the, with the VA and that's a growing partnership and um, <clears throat> will continue to grow. We have a, a big outpatient center here. We have a lot of veterans in the, in the Austin area and it's been hard for them to get the care that they need um, and we're gonna partner with the VA to solve that problem. Um, we are working on the redesign for the Austin State Hospital, got a nice, uh, grant to, uh, to begin that work. That's really not just the hospital itself, that's thinking differently about how the mental health system works. And that's been, a, again, a wonderful project that's involved a lot of the community players. The, these folks are falling through the cracks and there's so many cracks in that system, including, including our jails. Um, and then we've gotten a, a great grant from SAMHSA um, to send people out to the homeless community to, to care for them where they live. Uh, so that means under bridges and by creeks and all of these areas. Um, and that's uh, creating a kind of new model for doing that, coordinated with hospital care, coordinated with clinic care. It's, it's really a cool uh, um, uh, model. And Tim and Audrey, I don't know if they're 
here have, have been wonderful in doing that. And then the opioid crisis, we've, we're working on getting additional funding for this. We've gotten some funding, um, and Seton has been wonderful in helping us to support this. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, we've created the B team, um, and uh, the buf buprenorphine team. It's so hard to say, that's why they say B team. But it's, it gets um, addicts started on uh, recovery medications at the best time possible, which is when they're hospitalized, and then continues afterwards. And that's a new model. That really hasn't, seems obvious. Again, it's like the, you know, the wheels on the, on the suitcase, but it really hadn't been done. And, and um, we think it's a, a great model that uh, uh, nationally should have uh, impact as well. Um, and also looked at opioid crisis too in women's health and reducing the risk of uh, opioid dependence in moms delivering, which is a bigger problem than, than I had ever realized. Um, we're now focused on how do we get out more out of the healthcare dollars, out of the clinics and hospitals into the community. Factor Health is one way that we've done that. We got a large grant from the Fiscal Health Foundation to begin that work, and that's bringing in more dollars from payers, which is the goal. Um, lots of emphasis on health equity. The quickest way to become a model healthy city is to focus on inequity. Um, and uh, there's tons of it here. Um, we are in some ways the healthiest city in the country and in more some ways the least healthy city in the country, all you know, in this same community. So we, we need to and we're ready to as a community take, take that on and, uh, and so we've at the most senior levels of our organization we're, uh, we're rolling that out. Um, and then um, we've also been, I should mention, thinking about how the economic ecosystem changes in Austin, how we bring partnering organizations, for-profits and non-profits. On the for-profit side, we've been quite successful in um, attracting new players. Um, and we, uh, we know the same can be done on the non-profit side, and we're looking forward to accelerating that um, through a variety of different programs. So, um, those are some of our, of our successes. Not, um, in, I should mention to space. So um, we, have, uh, we are going to build a new building. Our next building will be just to the south of this parking garage over here, the one across the street behind me. Um, and it will uh, be a public-private building. It's a way of generating some revenue that comes back to Central Health, which is great. So there's a, a nice ground lease that, uh, that um, uh, benefits our community but it also is bringing partnering organizations in uh, to, to our community. We're not exactly sure who's gonna be housed there with us, but we know it'll be a combination of for-profits and non-profits, and then some of our folks will be down there. Um, it's a pretty large building, 300,000 square feet, so um, it's, uh, it, it will change the landscape and begin to change what happens to the, to the south of us. Our finances are not easy. You know, they may sound easy, but they are not. Um, we had... Uh, 157 million in expenditures last year. Um, we're projected to go up to, uh, you know, our, our beginning of year budget was, a, was 200 million in expenditures. That exceeds our revenue. That was expected. We knew that that would happen. Uh, as a growing medical school, we have a lot of, of costs related to hiring people who can't work when they immediately arrive and having buildings that are actually quite expensive and are just as expensive whether they're a third full or completely full and they can't be completely full on, on day one. So there are a number of, of uh, expected expenditures and, and an expected shortfall. Um, and we have cushion to allow us to uh, continue with, a, with some deficit, but we have to close that gap. We're, we're a nonprofit, we have to make it all work, right? So there, we will have challenges. This is part of moving from rethink. You can, thinking does not generate income, Making and doing does. And so we have to be uh, you know, moving over to that. That's a big issue for us, a big pivot that started to happen this last year and will continue to happen this year. We're actually ahead of budget this year thanks to more clinical activity than, than we had initially budgeted for. So that's all good, but it's not good enough. Um, and so we need to continue to work on, on that. We're really ambitious people and so we're, you know, we're building for the future. And philanthropy is a really critical part of that, and a number of you have been philanthropists. We've raised 220 million from uh, 2,200 donors, so large base, but some really, really large uh, donors in here. Um, the Kane Foundation was one of the early ones. This is, uh, you know, Frank, Frank Dinius is part of that 
organization, and, and actually my chair is supported um, by them. But we have a number of others, including some gigantic ones, um, uh, the Livestrong Foundation. Colin has helped us with uh, um, the Value Institute. Um, and of course, the Michael Susan Dell Foundation, um, and Janet and Aaliyah, thank you so much for, for that help, which continues not just in that founding gift, but in many other uh, uh, gifts that have allowed us to move our, our shared agenda together for this community. The Mova family, um, who've helped us in the, in the neurosciences, um, uh, build the Mova uh, neurosciences clinics, and then the, the Wong family in ophthalmology, also a very large gift. So these, wonderful to have this big base, but also these, um, uh, these uh, large uh, organizations that have provided critical help. So um, the other thing as we grow is um, we have to think about how quickly we grow. There are a lot of risks in growth, right? We become larger and larger. We become more and more focused on operations, which is important. But as we focus, if we focus too much on operations, then we reduce innovation. We make it harder to innovate. We make it harder to be differentiated, particularly when not all our partners, including whether they're insurance companies or whatever, are ready to innovate at the pace that we want to, right? So we, there's a risk of making compromises too early if we grow too fast. This is a big issue for, for us coming up. Um, also, it, we, I need to grow as a leader. Um, so I have, uh, I have definitely made mistakes, and I will continue to make mistakes. Um, I think uh, uh, all of us do, and we should acknowledge that. I think humility is a really important part of the way we need to approach this community and our role in it. We don't, have, um, we don't have the answers, right? That was part of my realization early on when I said, gosh, we need to do research, and then, gosh, the research enterprise is broken. We, we don't, science doesn't provide these answers. The answers have to come from uh, listening. Listening first, that deep listening that comes in human-centered design is one manifestation for that, but also community engagement and having a diverse group in which we work with, partnering deeply and remembering that we're here to address human needs. It's all about the human and how we deliver the best result for that, for that human. And as a leader, I am, I'm good on the human need stuff, but where I have trouble is that I'm, I have difficulty making difficult decisions that hurt people. And unfortunately, in this job, I have to do that. And um, so I am learning, and I um, thank you all for bearing with me um, as we do that. So the, you know, this is, you're not, the, the thing we say in skiing, I'm a big skier, is that you're, if you're not falling, you're not learning. So, um, but this is not the, the, this, the hill that we're on. <laughs> and when I first found this slide, I was like, oh, you see the tracks over on the right of the big mountain? And I was like, yeah, that's doable, actually. That's a, that's, a fun, that's a fun run. But that's not the run that I'm trying to show you here. The run that I'm showing you, see the two little people in the middle of that little crevasse up there? There are two people standing up there. That's the run. So we have chosen a difficult run down this mountain. Um, and I would say we're part way down. So let's just look ahead real quickly. I realize I'm, I'm, I've gone on a little too long. In clinical care, you can expect in the next five years that we have created a system of care that is truly focused on the patient. And they are actively engaged in every step of the care process, and they are active participants in how that care is delivered. In the next five years, I think we're going to see proof points not only of person-centered care, we are also going to see proof points of person-centered health, where we are working with people around all of their needs, not just those that can be delivered through a medical complex. That, we believe, is the future of what the work under the Community Impact Pillar can help contribute. In five or ten years, what I'm hoping for is that we can really be viewed as a world-class research institution. It's a 25-year process, not a two-year process, and it grows from building strengths in a few areas that are foundations for a larger growth.
Where do I see Dome Med School in the next five years? I see Dome Med School as being highly sought out for residency training programs for medical students to come to because we are doing things that are innovative and creative. I see Dome Med making a difference in Central Texas and in the state of Texas and even nationally. I do believe that what starts here will change the world. I know, those are, videos are great. All right, now I, I told him I would read this last part, which I almost never do, so, um, but they, they wanted me to, so. Um, these, these last five years have been an amazing ride, from parking lots and tennis courts to a million square feet uh, in, this, in this part of campus. I mean, nothing to this, I mean, it's really amazing. From five people, to over a thousand, including internationally recognized leaders in the generation that will replace them. From a crazy draft curriculum to, it's only sort of crazy, but it was a little, um, uh, to a successful series of classes um, setting new standards for medical education um, and visited by people from all over the world. And for a, a dream for a better health system to an array of busy clinics and hospital activities that are demonstrating the power of remaking and also are the envy of, of institutions from across the world. So we've had visitors from you know, all over Europe, all over Asia, um, and more and more coming to see how we do it. We've come together not just as a school, but through the broader UT community with the kind of multidisciplinarity that others can only envy. And even more dramatically, through a deep-seated partnership with the broader Austin community. Yes, we can say that health is happening here. The next five years are even more important than the last as we prove that our ideas, people, partnerships, and culture can truly impact the larger broken healthcare system. I, for one, am confident that there's no institution better suited, no location better placed than right here at this special moment in time. <laughs>